What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bronx Pinstripe Show. It's still spring training. It's almost the week, Scott, where everyone's like, oh, there's more spring training. Right. I forgot. There's more of this. Can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, MLB. You still got two weeks of that. You still Three got two weeks. weeks of, of Three weeks. No, two weeks of, say, of, of, of oh, right. this until you say that. Yeah. Because the last week is the real is the real uh, the week that we start saying things. But yeah, man, I, I like it. It's fine. Keep it going. This is uh, this is better than not having baseball. I love seeing all the young guys, even though now is the point where the young guys are, are being sent away and, and, you know, all the veteran guys are getting their they're working. They're just getting the reps and, and the at bats that, that don't count. So it, you don't get to the opportunity to see, you know, the Spencer Jones of the world or the, you know, Ben Rice or the guys that you don't get to see very often who are really grinding and, and like taking these at bats extremely seriously because they know they have something to prove while they're up at camp. That's, that's my favorite part of, of spring training. And some of those, a lot of those guys are now being, uh, you know, sent back down to, uh, to minor league camp, but yeah, man, things are going well this spring so far, knock on wood. Like, uh, you know, they, they had a guy up in the, in the booth. I don't even know who it was. It was a writer, I think in some, but the, what's the big story of the spring so far? The fact that there is no real big story of the spring is, is the one, right? There's no huge, there's no big injury that we're all talking about. There's no big thing that we're all talking about. Again, there's no big wood, position battle, knocking which... on wood. Last year, yeah. we spent the whole spring talking about is Anthony Volpe going to win the starting shortstop job? Like that was yeah. the whole spring. That's basically what it was. And I mean, I guess the big story is Juan Soto. Like Juan, Juan Soto's Soto, the story. Yeah. Juan Soto is the new superstar on the team. It wasn't a free agent signing, but it was it's the biggest acquisition the Yankees made. The, I guess the second biggest, biggest acquisition of the offseason around Major League Baseball. That's the story for the Yankees. And damn, let me tell you. Is he having a strong spring training? It is only spring training. It's March 6th, yada, yada, yada. Throw all the caveats on it you want. I understand. But, that, but that's the beauty, right? The stories are coming from within the, the games and, and the actual performances on a, on a positive note uh, from, from the guys. And everybody here is like, we were just talking about this before we hit record. It's different when you see the guy, you know, on an everyday basis. It's different when you're paying attention to him in a, in a different way, as we all are now. You know, I know we all said Juan Soto is a really good baseball player, a really good baseball player. But now that he's wearing the pinstripes and you're you're kind of, you know, micro, you're watching every little step that he's making, every little movement, all the things you you tend to appreciate things more and you you identify a lot more um, when you're looking this closely. So he's been fun so far. And it's all, yeah, it's only a few weeks in the spring because we would see Juan Soto, obviously, postseason when he was playing in the postseason with, with the nationals that's when he exploded onto the major league baseball scene we would see him whenever he would play against the yankees and then i would just see highlights and highlights can only tell you so much because a highlight is obviously going to be good the result is going to be good so oh a juan soto highlight of him hitting a missile yeah cool i know he can do that watching his tim take more at bats uh, I specifically am referring to the Sunday game. He hit a home run in the first inning. He hit a almost a home run down the left field line in his second at bat, which like looked like a pop up off of his bat, and it, it the the left fielder literally caught it at the three eighteen sign down the left field line, and then he hit a, a seeing eye single in his third at bat. I think that put him to six of eight uh, on the spring at that point. The confidence and the command of the at bat that he shows every single time I've watched him take a full at bat this spring is unlike any player on the Yankees. Now, there's Aaron Judge, of course, who is also one of the best hitters in baseball, has been the best hitter on the Yankees for years. But Judge has command of, of at-bats, no doubt. But he also, at times, will just look com completely lost, completely overmatched. And he actually took an at-bat in that Sunday game. I think it was, he struck out on four pitches, not quite three pitches. But he, he, he just was completely fooled on a slider low and away and, and just sort of waved at it, walked off to the dugout. I know Juan Soto will look foolish at some point this season, many points this season, because it's baseball. That's baseball, probably the first Susan. week in April. Yeah. yeah. That's baseball. Susan, the best players, the hall of famers, they get out seven, seven out of 10 times. I understand that, but watching Juan Soto's command of the at bat is so comforting as a fan having watched so many garbage ass at bats over the past couple seasons to know that we we've got Soto and judge back to back in a lineup. Like I've compared this on the show to Ortiz and Manny with the Red Sox, where it literally strikes fear into the opposing team, the opposing fan base, the opposing manager. Oh shit. Juan Soto and Aaron judge are coming up next inning. We cannot let anybody sniff first base because we will be screwed. If that is the case can't tell you how fun that is going to be this year. 
Yes. And the to build off of that, Rizzo is having a very good spring. Looks like he's, you know, and and says that he's fully past this uh, you know, the the head injury that that plagued him um, you know, on the IL for a while, but then also really for the remainder of the season last year. It, it was clear that he wasn't wasn't right and you know that when it, when you have an issue with with your timing um, and uh, you know the all the things that you're doing at the plate, that's a problem uh, when your when your head is not fully back. Everything he said, everything he looks like, you know, fully back. The guy looks like you know first uh, first couple months of of last year where he's going to be great protection on the other side of that. And you mentioned don't want to sniff a base runner before then. Well, you got a professional hitter in DJ Lemayhu. Uh, at the at the leadoff spot, you know, starting off the season here as the as that primary guy who who again, you know, second half of last year looked much closer to the DJ that we that we all know and love. Um, so you know, hopefully that the off season has treated him well. He's he's in the best shape he's been in in two years probably. Um, and if you're if you're getting a guy like that who's going to get a lot of fastballs, going to get to get a lot of things over the plate. DJ LeMahieu knows what to do with that stuff, and and it doesn't have to doesn't have to overdo it. And he knows that damn well that. You know, he he slaps a ball through, uh, you know, through a hole in the infield. He's got Juan Soto and Aaron Judge behind him, and then oh, oh, by the way, you know, Anthony Rizzo, uh, but behind those guys. So there's a ton of protection for for the two guys as well, which is exciting. And, and just seeing the at bats is good. And honestly, we could talk more about this in a, in, in a bit here too. But like Volpe does, he does look different. He he looks a lot more comfortable. He looks more confident at the plate. Um, and, you know, I think a year under his belt is going to make a big difference. And again, the same story for, for Volpe that Le, what I just said for LeMayu, he's going to get a ton of fastballs, a ton of fastballs, and they're going to be over the plate. They're going to attack Anthony Volpe. And if Anthony Volpe is, has learned the lessons from last year, has taken the off season to, you know, work on that swing and, 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 you know, better the approach, he's going to have a really good year in that nine spot because he's essentially, you know, the, the last peg before, uh, you know, the, the lineup of death comes, uh, comes across. So he's going to get a lot of opportunities to hit the ball. Yeah. You're talking about the effect that that core of players is going to have on the rest of the lineup. And it, you it's, they're not going to survive if only Soto and judge are hitting this year. Like we understand that, but it should have a positive effect on the rest of the lineup. I agree with you, <laughs> whether it is Rizzo, whether it's Stanton, Glaber, like what two of those three guys need to have good years, I think, still behind Judge and Soto just to, to complete that middle of the lineup. But it still will have a pot. There, there's going to be so many opportunities with one or two guys on base for those players. P pitchers not wanting to get beat by by Soto and Judge. And you have to pitch to Soto because you're not going to walk someone in front of Aaron Judge. I guess there will be the situations where if no one is hitting behind Aaron Judge, in theory, you could just pitch around both of those guys and then say, Rizzo, Stanton, Glaber, whoever, go go beat, beat us. Because we're not going to get beat by the two best, two of the top five best players in baseball. We'll get beat by the 57th best player in baseball. That's going to happen, though. That's a, that that is going to be the approach for a lot of teams, especially especially early. They're gonna they're gonna test that that number four batter. So you know, Rizzo coming out of the gate being effective is, is, you know, talk about X factor. Like if he is, is giving protection for, for judge in that spot, then yes, you're, you're having a very difficult time to pitch around both of those guys. So um, that four, that four hitter, that four hitter is going to be massively important for, for protection of those two guys, because they will pitch around them, especially later in the year, you're going to see that happen. So the protection needs to be there. Um, so yeah, a lot, I'm, I'm glad that Anthony Rizzo looks like he's, in 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 good form you know back to to the guy that that we expect him to be um, because i do think he's going to have a really important role this year and that the we all uh i mean concussion recovery is just like such an unknown that it's like it, who knows what he's it, he looks good so far that's awesome and, and i'm hoping that's the case but it was just like it was such an unknown to me going into the year still that uh, it, it's not like coming back from a hamstring injury or coming back from a shoulder injury where it's like, okay, well, the doctors are saying it is medically repaired. So this guy is going to be back to what he should be. It's, it's just completely different. It is, but you, I mean, you have to listen to the player and, and we watch and all the things that he's doing and looks like he's very comfortable. And, and the way he's talking seems like he's, 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 he's past it. So yeah, all, all signs are pointing towards the guy is over it and, and he feels great and is ready to have, you know, an awesome year. Yeah, because you also mentioned like some of the young players are now starting to be sent down from Major League Camp. Spencer Jones had an unbelievable uh, 
stint at the major league camp. He hit 467, 556, over a 1200 OPS with seven hits, a six run scored, a home run, which was in his first at bat. And the best ring, stat of four all. Four RBIs. The, 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 best at, the best stat of all is that in 15 at bats, 82 pitches, he did not swing and miss one time. So you talk about control of the strike zone and, and you know, making you feel comfortable. Spencer Jones doing the Juan Soto thing uh, up, at the, uh, up at the major league camp. So, dude, the kid looks way better than I was expecting at this point even. And he struck out like 100 and 155 times. Yeah. One, 155 strikeouts last year in, in his minor league season. So you look at and, – and obviously the comparisons to Judge are going to continue to happen because of the, the size and, and just him coming up through the through the organization the way he is but but the way that judge made those those um adjustments from level to level and and you know made the adjustments on on the swing and miss is the was the biggest thing for him um you know if if he can if he can trend in that direction and cut down those strikes and have better control of the of the uh of the zone like the kid's got special special attributes there's no doubt about it and he's even got more wheels like he's he's a freak athlete he really is and he's probably gonna get bigger as he as he's getting older he's not close to his athletic prime here um probably gonna put on some more pounds too so i would expect even more power coming from him but the fact that he's got that control in us in a spring camp is is really impressive that was really it it was also impressive because it's not like he was just slapping the ball around (laughs) like he 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 slugged 556 okay he hit 467 so he was he was impacting the baseball to borrow a term from from aaron boone so it's not like he's just trying to, you know, slap and make contact and follow off pitches. Like, no, he, he is he's hitting the ball hard and not swinging and missing. Like, again, he's going up against mostly minor league pitchers in, in the games that, that he played early in spring. It, it's, it's major league pitchers making their first appearance of the spring, or it is minor league pitchers trying to prove themselves and trying to prove that I don't care. It's still get, impressive yes, to have get, 82 pitches seen and not, not swing and miss one time for a guy that struck out. 155 strikeouts in a, in a minor league that's season. That's a lot. That's a lot of strikeouts. Yeah. That's how a lot of strikeouts. How many, a lot times, of stri- w- how many a lot times has strikeouts. Juan Soto swung and missed this spring? I don't know. <laughs> but. <laughs> so your confidence level should be not, higher. Let's not compare the two yet. Okay. <laughs> let's wait a little while. Uh, let's stick, with the, stick with the judge comparisons. 155 strikeouts at the major league level is a lot. At the minor league level, which the season is shorter, is even more. That's a boatload of strikeouts. Well, he also made that jump from from single to double A, which yep. they say is the biggest jump for for a position player. I've in the also box. heard that that double A to triple A is the biggest jump. That I've heard triple A to let's also triple A to major league seems to be the biggest jump for a lot yeah, of for the Yankees. Prospects. It is for the Yankees. It definitely is. Unless you're that well, you know, you you get guys like. Uh, like Gary Sanchez, you come out and make that transition with no issue. And then okay, all of a well, sudden, it's not since Gary Sanchez in 20, what year was that? 2016 that he was a, a rookie. Not since, since then have we seen a guy make that transition so seamlessly. Jason Dominguez for a handful of at-bats. <clears throat> eight, eight games did he play? A eight at-bats, at-bats did he play? Yeah, a handful. He, he was on the path. Um, Cashman said the plan is to start Spencer Jones in double A. That'll soon be triple A. And then, yeah, maybe there's a chance we see him at the end of the year. If here's the thing though, don't want to rush Spencer Jones. They're not going to be, in a, they're not going to be in a position where you need an out. If, if they're in a position where they need an outfielder, that, that that's bad. Like something has gone terribly wrong yeah. because of all the outfield depth that they've added. So then best case scenario, the Yankees have like a nine game lead going into September and they're like, yeah, let's, let's get Spencer Jones sometime. Yeah. But well, also they need to keep those reps going because we know what happens when there's a, uh, there's a, a playoff buy or any of that. Any, anytime there's a long gap in, in playing seemingly the team is, uh, is eliminated there for like soon after, but he's going to get some time at some point, but you're right. He doesn't have to get pushed into any, any type of, uh, of situation where he needs to be the guy at all. Uh, or needs to be at this level at all. You got Dominguez who's, you know, recovering. We don't know what that's going to look like, but the fact that you have another guy that's, that's, you know, on par to, to that level of prospect um, is, is a very, very good thing. It's a lot of insurance understanding that the, the outfield very well could change uh, in the, in the next couple of years. And going back to like a point that I made, I don't remember when end of last year off season at some point, I really do believe that this year for Stanton is 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 make or break. If he shows anything remotely close to what we saw last year, uh, you know, with the new trim down, with adjustments at the plate and all that, if we see him as as a negative offensive player like he has been, 
there's not going to be a big tolerance for keeping him around on the roster. I have a feeling that they, at some point in the, in, you know, whether it's next year or the year after are going to eat a contract at some point, they're eating that contract. Right. We, I think we all agree two, with that. We identified that they would eat two years. They seem to eat two years of contracts. They ate two years of Hicks. They ate two years of Ellsbury. Like they're not going to eat four years of Stan. They will, they will eat the contract. If there's a guy barking down the, down the throat of, of pl- for playing time, not four years. Bullshit. Maybe if not even need, three years. If they need playing time, if they if Spencer Jones and Dominguez are real players, it's going to be a problem for 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 uh, for Stanton and and playing time because you're not going to have it, and you can't keep Spencer Jones. You're assuming in AAA. You're assuming they resign Juan Soto, which obviously that should be Plan A. Correct. But if Spencer Jones has a really good year this year, and and, and the Yankees or MLB Pipeline updated uh, is releasing their new prospects rankings. Uh, Jason Dominguez is number one in the Yankee system. Spencer Jones, number two, Roderick Arias, number three, Chase Hampton, um, number four, Austin Wells, number five in the Yankee system in the top 100 overall baseball prospects. Dominguez ranks 41st Jones, 84th Arias, 86th and Hampton, 92nd Jones at 84 seems like it, it would not surprise me at the mid season rankings. If he's in the 30 50. or 40 range. I don't think there's a huge gap between 40 and 80 uh, right. with these rankings. I think when and you start rankings, getting past 25, then the guys – between 25 and 100, or maybe it's 40 and 100, the guys can shift quite a bit. It's also so – it's so fluid, right? Because these rankings like are done on scouting reports. There's a bunch of input from from people from end of last season, winter – and maybe early spring training, but, but it's not like all of these rankings were done in the past two weeks of spring training. Like, no, th- this is information that has been funneling into these rankings for months and months. For sure. And so, like you said, the difference between the 45th guy and the 85th guy and the 99th guy is, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a hair, it's a hair margin. It's so thin. Yeah, no, it is. And, and obviously the, the beginning of, and a lot of these guys are going to move up a level as well, you know, depending on where they ended and where they're starting. Uh, for for the new year so there will be a shift there if a guy shows that he's you know making the adjustment to that next level you, you see you see a shift so this first month two months when do they do them again are they mid-se- every- they do a mid-season ranking they it's do mid- they so do it's tw- preseason it's, it's three times a year no i think it's just two i think it's just two it's preseason and mid-season they don't do it after the season as well i don't think so i think they usually do a mid-season ranking it comes out usually around the all-star break yeah, which is setting up nicely for the uh, trade deadline for people to point to. Yeah, well, so my point about Spencer Jones is, assuming he has a good year in the minors this year across double and triple A, like his prospect ranking at the midseason will be in the top 50, call it, okay? He's already been tagged untouchable by some reporters around the Yankees that uh, they were not willing to entertain Spencer Jones in a Dylan Cease trade or or any other trade on the market. But and what, th- that's the narrative you want from the Yankee side, by the way, like that's a good narrative to have, because to me, that's, that's saying that like, this guy is a commodity that we are not willing to part with yet. So if you ask for him, you better come, you better come correct. But we've heard this before. Big, they big, weren't big, willing to trade Miguel Andujar and Clint Frazier and, and all, and Esteban, not Esteban Flora, but like we, we've heard that we're not willing to trade blank player Rob many Snyder. times, yeah. many times. And then that player, then we're like, okay. Where is that player? Why isn't he playing at the major league level? Well, he, he's still in AAA. He needs another, all this crap to come to find out he can't play at the major league level. I just hope with Spencer Jones, whatever happens, don't have it be that. Trade him for something good or have him pan out at the major league level. Do not end up in a situation where it's 2026, Spencer Jones is vying for a spot in spring training, and then he's waived because he has no options left. Like, yeah, but what you're saying is a very dangerous proposition because they believe that when they're not trading said player that they are going to make an impact in the major league. So it's not like they're not trying to do that. They are trying to do that. They just mis misevaluate you know, their misevaluate prospects. the prospect. So, but your but your your two options here are exactly what they're doing. They're just not my doing two, it well. No, my two options are don't be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Don't fuck it up. Don't be wrong. Make sure that you're absolutely correct. I and think, you're right. There's there's going to be an opportunity if they don't sign Juan Soto. But in my head, they're going to sign Juan Soto because I think I agree. Understanding what is going to happen hopefully this year and seeing the impact of a guy like him on this lineup, he's worth everything in today's market. He's worth everything he's there asking. Is for. a world though in which Jason Dominguez comes back over the summer and has a good second half for the Yankees. 
Spencer Jones has a, a good minor league season and is a top 30, top 40 prospect. And the Yankees go into next season saying, we're comfortable losing Juan Soto because we have Judge, we have Dominguez, and we have Spencer Jones, who's going to be the rookie outfielder next year. And then maybe they sign a depth outfielder. Like maybe Verdugo's good this year and you sign him as a as a depth piece. Or maybe you pick up some other veteran outfielders, things like that. I'm not saying I want that to happen, but that that there's a world in which that could happen. There's also a world where Verdugo is in the offseason getting that uh, Cody Cody Bellinger dollars, that Cody Bellinger type contract. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I think this is why we got the comment on the YouTube that people think we hate each other. <laughs> because because we fight about the fact that you think Alex Verdugo is is on par with Cody Bellinger. I didn't say that. You said better. No, I said he's going to have the statistics the statistics are going to be there this year. The statistics are going to be better, but that doesn't make him better. Doesn't make him better. No. It just makes he's, he's going to be in a he's in a great situation in a walk year and he feels like that kind of an asshole to have like an unbelievable year in a walk year. To... He looks super weird with no facial hair. Yeah. I'm getting used to it now. It's fine. He's got some rosy cheeks. He needs to get a little tan. Do you, do you know what the, the weirdest person without to look without facial hair was when Brian McCann came over to the Yankees and shaved. Oh, I got one. He's, he's super he, bald. And so like he just looked like a thumb because he was he was he was so white. He's such a round face and so bald everywhere. So to that everywhere to that well, point everywhere that sounds... we could see i bet he was super hairy back brian mccann definitely oh. hairy back okay stop the the worst person that's ever worn the pinstripes and for similar reasons but but also just because of scar tissue was oh, kevin euculus yeah. oh i i thought you were gonna go randy johnson no kevin euculus was the worst because that guy's always had the 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 goatee and he's always been in an ugly uniform and then when he came over to shave he looked like an asshole can i put my hand up and admit something shameful you liked kevin euclid i did like kevin euclid yeah when the yankees signed kevin euclid i was actually excited that was what the 2013 season when a rod was serving a suspension i don't know that's a kevin you, that's a kevin euclid kevin euclid was one of the most annoying players on the red side yes i hated his guts i hated his stupid the way he held his bat he hate like the way he, he was it. taking with his shit at the plate yeah. he, he was such a dirty boston red sock but he was such a pain in the ass to get out he grinded at bats he always was like top in the league for walks for pitches seen for for pitches spoiled and i was excited to have that on the yankees finally and then he got hurt in the first week of the season and he was never seen from again he married tom brady's sister and he's doing something else now yeah which which just it just it just pains me the fact that he wore the uniform because of all that situation not well, only that did era he... has a lot of guys that probably i know you that wore that wore the uniform. well him specifically but yes there's a lot of very strange very strange like, vernon could... vernon, wells, vernon wells andrew jones um i mean god lyle was... overbay lyle overbay <laughs> The list you could we, you, you could, could make you could make a full obscure Yankee list just from that. I did that standard. blog, Logan. Yeah. Can you Google this obscure Yankee thing on Bronx? I wrote that blog like ten years ago, and I made an All Star team. Like literally, <laughs> everyone positions one through nine on the diamond had mm -hmm. made All Star teams at some point Brian in their Roberts. career. Brian Roberts. They, they all made All Star teams in their career, and then when they were with the Yankees, it was the last year of their career or something, and they sucked. But are you are you Got talking it. about the bizarro Yankees? I think I Andrew am. Andrew Rotondi, seven years ago. Seven um, years ago. In the heyday. Do you want to go through it a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah what's the line? All right. Uh, you have it in here by position. So, catcher, you had Pudge. Yeah. 2008. Uh, first base, Andy Phillips in 2006. Second base, Lyle Tony Overbay Womack. is a better one than that. Andy Tony Phillips Womack. came up with the system, didn't he? Tony Womack. Yeah, Tony Womack. Second base, 20, uh, 2005. Eric Chavez at third base, 2012. Eric Chavez. That's a good one. Eduardo I like Nunez. Eduardo Nunez. Nunez doesn't count. Well, they obscure. never had they never had a bizarro shortstop because they're Yankee Jeter. Theater. Uh, left. They had him before. They had him before Jeter. They had him before Jeter. Yeah. No doubt about it. But, okay. Left field. Brandon Wells, 2013. Randy yep. Velarde. Uh, Bubba Crosby, 2005. Uh, okay. Raul Mondesi, 2002. Pitcher Aaron, Aaron Small, 2005. 2005 Aaron Small. That's Aaron Small we, was, we a, was a was a was a breath of fresh air when he I came. I mean they out. also had so many bizarro pitchers but like Didn't Aaron think, Small go like 11 and 0 when he came yes, up something, he, something he, like that. 2005 he went like 10 and 0 down the stretch and single-handedly carried the Yankees to the playoffs. Yeah, Aaron Small. Love it. <laughs> Him and uh Sean Chacon. That was their one two punch. Yeah, that's right. From Colorado. 
Yeah. And then we all know how that worked out in the playoffs. Not good. Yeah. Bizarro Yankees. How'd we get on this topic? Uh, I don't remember. Facial hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> facial hair. <laughs> we did. We took it from facial hair to Bizarro Yankees. Anyway, um, what I was saying about Spencer Jones. That was is, a is, brutal is, transition. <laughs> is that. <laughs> Where the, what the hell were we talking about? Just like, because the Yankees have been, we've criticized them and they've been criticized in the industry for overvaluing their own prospects. They have not properly evaluated their own prospects. You, you need to be better at that. Like evaluating who to trade away is as important as who to keep. And I think they've done a good job at evaluating who to trade away. But maybe that's just because no one has been good because everyone they've kept has not turned out to be good. So basically everyone has been bad. So whether you trade them away or not, it's just like they haven't been good. So yeah, no one's come back to bite them in the ass, but then no one they've kept have actually, has actually panned out. No one crazy. Who's the outfielder with Texas, Duran, that, that was traded for uh, the, the first trade to get um... – Who was that trade? What was that trade? It was uh, – what's his face? The strikeout king of the world. Joey Gallo. Joey Gallo. Oh. And Duran was, was he? He was playing every day in left field, I think. For, no, he's, for... He's, he is very good. Yeah, he's he's a good he's a good player. That they gave up. When I know was that they, he? When, was when they he traded ever... Gallo, they also they they got they got a good player in return. Uh, but but Duran was definitely one of those guys. Well, Duran was never considered like a Yankees uh, top prospect. Well, like what can we? Find I think out, he was like, a top. He was a top was? five or was he, he was... top five in the Yankee system? He was pretty good last year with Texas in 122 games. He had 106 OPS plus. So okay, that's well, a, you let, know. Let, let's let's pump the brakes on good. Yeah, I'm not saying he's like an all star player here, but he was a he was a good player. I think he had a really good first half also, and yeah. then like he like you know maybe a 110 OPS plus. And then... Could have used him last year. In the field. <clears throat> well, because if you if you think back to some of like the more famous pro- OPS plus in the first half. Some of the more famous prospect trades that Cashman has made, meeting trade away prospects to acquire a guy. Let's go back to the 2017 Sunny Gray trade. Like Dustin Fowler, uh, Caprellian, and uh, Mateo. None of those guys panned out for Oakland. Mateo's I mean, been Mateo, a good player in the But like uh, three teams later. Yeah. Okay. So like as much as the Sunny Gray thing blew up in the Yankees' face, you're not sitting there being like, oh man, like you traded away a future 10-year all-star to get to get 100%. This. So, so no, it's like yeah, it's they... kind of like, okay. Then 2018 – who did they uh, trade away? When did they acquire Paxton? Was that 18 or 19? That was uh, before 19. Before 19. It was 18. It was the Justice Sheffield, obviously. They who, traded away Justice Sheffield. Yeah. And they properly evaluated other, him. Pieces, they, 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 they did. <laughs> and, and, and I remember that was like one of those times when, when that trade was made. We were like questioning that because Justice Sheffield was not only a high-ranked Yankees prospect. He was a high-ranked MLB prospect. I was not questioning that, if you remember. I did I not like Justice remember. Sheffield. But, but like – but I remember that. But like I feel like why why did you not like Justice Sheffield? I just I, – I didn't understand I, the hype. Because I, I didn't probably think because I liked Justice Sheffield. No, it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with his stuff. I just didn't – I didn't see – I didn't yeah. see what so – good what, job. What it was? Can in, the Yankees like, hire prospect. you as a scout then? Because just give me in the common sense department; it'll trickle down. You know, some of that is no. In, they've got it. We're going to talk to Max coming I up know. about the new common sense uh, czar or whatever the hell the common sense Derek department Dietrich. has an influence on scouting. Um, and it's probably it more have, baseball scouting. Well, it should definitely have an. It definitely will have an influence on trades. Common which sense. has an influence on scouting. Yes, all of the above. I. It's there's. There is a very good layer of common sense in many different places of the New York Yankees organization that ne- is needed. And yes, mm-hmm. I have a bone to pick with uh, with the uh, with the league. Or I'm sorry, with the team uh, that we'll talk with uh, with Max about. So they, um, they, you know, they traded they've traded away a bunch of prospects over the years, but but no one to this point has really come back to bite them in the ass. That's true, and. You know, because they haven't had very good prospects is the first that's, problem. That was my point. Yes, that was yeah, my point. That's the, that... that's the biggest problem. The biggest issue is that the prospect level of the guy, whether you're properly or, or improperly evaluating, guy's just not that good. So that's, that's part, of the, uh, part of the issue here. 